Thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce Travis Blancet. He's one of our finest history government students. Um, he developed a fascination with Sweden in my Government 307 class, I believe it was, uh, five years, two years ago. Um, and he has developed that, Women, Politics, and Culture, last semester. Um, I uh, am always impressed with Mr. Blancet, particularly because he's a, a young man of his generation um, who cares about uh, equality, cares about the other half of the population. Um, so, take it away, Mr. Blancet. Thank you. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, so as Dr. Centeno said, um, I have this huge fascination with the country of Sweden. And um, before I go into that, um, my goal here is to show the difference in how good equality can be for a country and how bad inequality can be for a country. Um, so over the course of three or four classes, um, I was introduced to Sweden and I was amazed at how they were very keen on gender equality in their country and um, keen on it at the government level where the government promoted gender equality in various ways. Um, so from that interest I wanted to see the other end of the spectrum and see um, what inequality looked like and how some countries give very little regard to gender equality. Uh, so the basis for my research began with the United Nations. Um, the United Nations has the Gender Inequality Index. Um, and what that is, is uh, the United Nations measures 187 countries for human development and then a subcategory of that is gender um, development. Um, there's 147 um, countries that are measured for gender development. Um, so Sweden is number one currently on the Gender Inequality Index and then at the bottom of that is uh, Yemen. Um, the Gender Inequality Index measures um, seats in Parliament that are held by women, um, the percent of secondary education degrees that are obtained um, by men and women, um, and then maternal mortality and uh, many more. Um, so then, like I said, my original research project was Yemen and Sweden, and then for the purpose of this presentation, I added some information on the United States to kind of engage where we are as a country compared to um, the two that are at the top and the bottom. Um, I gave that statistic. Um, the United States is currently ranked 47, so we're closer to the top, but um, from many of the articles that I read, um, people were actually amazed at how low we were to the top. Um, and then the three main areas um, where I, that I chose to measure inequality because of the abundance of information were education, um, political representation, and violence towards women. Okay, education for women in Yemen. Um, 7.6% of women in the country of Yemen have a, um, edu have a secondary degree, so a bachelor's degree, um, or well, they do also include associate's degrees. 24.4% um, of men have a secondary education, so um, three men to every one woman have a secondary education degree in Yemen. Um, another key issue in education in Yemen is that it's, um, I guess a very sporadic country. Um, there's, um, I should say, there's um, small communities scattered throughout the country and then very few large communities. Um, so 72% of girls in, in Yemen live in these small rural areas where they have very little access to education and 28% of them live in urban areas where um, the education is more prevalent but unfortunately that still doesn't mean that they're going to have the opportunity to that education. Um, the number one reason for women leaving education in Yemen is getting married. Um, in the country of Yemen the average age to get married is 12 years old. Um, the legally, the legal age is 15 so this law is frequently broken. Um, Another um, sub-aspect of that law is that you can get married at the age of 15, but you can't um, consummate the marriage until the woman is deemed to be of sexual maturity. Um, but as I stated with the age being 12, none of these laws are strictly adhered to. 
Um, a poll done um, on women, uh, well, girls were interviewed in Yemen and, uh, as to why they dropped out of school, uh, what could be done to make them stay in school, and it was um, the, the most common aspect of that poll was that women are more comfortable with female teachers. The problem here is that there's a large circle um, that it's really hard, that's really hard for women to get out of. Um, because if women at the age of 12 get married and are encouraged by their husband not to stay in the education system, then that's fewer and fewer women that are able to get up to a secondary degree and teach these girls um, um, at their age. So. Um, it creates this circle that Yemen has yet to be able to get out of. Education for women in Sweden. Um, and before I go into this, um, I'd like to reiterate that even though I've stated that I am very biased towards Sweden, this, these are not my views, these are statistical results. Um, equality of genders in Yemen is stressed through the edu educational system at an early age. So um, not only is it the parental values that they receive at home, but during the day while they're at school, they're also receiving the same values. Um, more women with undergraduate degrees than men in Sweden. 60% um, of women have an undergraduate degree, an associate's or a bachelor's, compared to 40% of men in Sweden. And uh, when you get into graduate degrees, it's a 50-50 split between men and women who are currently either earning those degrees or have earned them. And uh, one of the key things in Sweden is that the government created a committee to enforce gender equality in, the, in schools. Um, and what they did was, in US dollars, they allocated $16.8 million um, to put towards different initiatives, different programs to teach students at a young age that gender equality is more important than gender inequality. And another key issue is that once you get to the college level in Yemen, there is a level playing field when it comes to female and male issue classes. So whereas in, in the United States, um, it's more common to see um, classes that deal with um, female issues because women do not have as much equality here as they do in Sweden. So there in Sweden, um, at, at the university level, you can take classes that deal with issues that face women and classes that um, deal with issues that face men. And education for women in the United States. Um, the 2010 census revealed that 29% of women have an undergraduate degree and 30% of men have an undergraduate degree. So it's significantly closer here than what we see if you look at something as extreme as Yemen, but not quite as much as when you look at Sweden. Um, and then also with that data, the age group 25 to 29 shows the biggest gap in favor of women, and that is that 35% of women between the ages of 25 and 29 have a bachelor's degree, and 29% of men in that age group have a bachelor's degree. So moving on to political representation, um, in Yemen, women have virtually no representation. Um, currently, there are 301 members of the Yemen parliament, and there is one woman in the parliament. So 300 men to one woman. Um, on the gender inequality index, they um, base this off of statistics, and statistic, or I should say percentages. Um, so in Yemen, 0.7% of their parliament is women. Um, women's representation has actually decreased in Yemen. Um, prior to 2003, there were two women in their parliament. So um, it has decreased, even though not very much. Two women is better than one. <laughs> Bear with me with that comment. Um, also, in the government, women equal half of a person, which creates an even bigger problem with this one woman that they have in parliament because um, nothing that she has done, stated, or voted on in parliament has counted um, towards any initiatives that their parliament 
has dealt with because she doesn't count as one person. Um, where, and that's where, when you go back to prior to 2003, um, that is actually when Yemen had one woman in parliament because the two women that they had counted as one woman's vote. So then if you move on to political representation for women in Sweden, um, the parliament is nearly equal. And in Sweden, um, it's a 349 member parliament, 185 of them are women, which is 47 percent. And 100 and I should, sorry, let me correct myself, 164 are women um, in the Swedish parliament and 185 are men. So um, not nearly as big of a deficit as what it is in Yemen. Um, the two main parties um, that push for gender equality in uh, Sweden are the Liberal Party and the Social Democrat Party, and both of them within their party, um, within parliament, parliament and at the local government level, they have a policy of a 50-50 split between men and women. Um, and this, this creates other issues because, uh, going to my next point, the Social Democrat Party, I believe, uh, yes, they have an initiative called Every Second on the List a Woman. And that brings the question up, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it's good because this creates um, a mandate that more women be in parliament and at the local government level. But it's also bad in many respects because then you don't know if the woman is being put in this seat because of her capabilities or simply because of her gender. Um, and another issue that was raised is because the name of this initiative, uh, which came about in 1994, is every second on the list a woman and not every first on the list a woman. So um, I did hours of research into why it was titled this and could not find anything. I did find um, one article where a member of the Social Democrat Party refused to be interviewed on the question. Um, but the main question that I brought up with this is why can't the woman be first on the list? Um, moving into the United States, um, women have lower representation in the U.S. compared to Sweden, um, but significantly more than women. There are 73 of the 435 women in the House of Representatives. Of the 435 representatives are women. Um, 17 of the 100 in Senate are women, which is a 16.8% overall, uh, which just to gauge where we are in relation to other countries, we could be doing significantly better, but at least we have more than one person in our government. <laughs> so the next one, and I think the biggest issue uh, that needs to be addressed with equality towards women is violence. Um, in Yemen, there is a large de desire for male offspring from the beginning. Um, and the problem with that is that when a woman gives birth to a female, um, she receives significant flack from her husband because they view it as she is the one who decided to give birth to a female instead of giving him a male heir. Um, also in Yemen, male violence and dominance is encouraged at an early age, and this isn't just at home, this is in the school system. So uh, when children in Yemen are at school, if a young boy is picking on a young girl, um, it is encouraged that the teacher turn their cheek and ignore it. That way men are exposed to their um, level of power at an early age, and women become acclimated to being um, considered less equal. It's a very sad thing. Um, also in Yemen, women can be arrested by any male for anything, um, which I was actually confused when I first read this because I didn't really understand how that worked. But what it is, is anyone from um, the Minister of the Interior all the way down to the local chef next door to you can arrest you if you are a woman for anything that they deem necessary for you to be arrested for. Yes. Um, and um, going further with that, women cannot defend themselves in court. Um, this goes back to 
women only equal half of a person, so if you are arrested on a charge and you are the only person to defend yourself, automatically um, your defense is considered null because you are only half of a person and you have no right to defend yourself. Um, so moving from those depressing statistics to violence towards women in Sweden, um, one of the biggest things and probably the biggest reason that I um, became interested in Sweden as it was that they were the first country from what I could see that did not hesitate to label men as the problem towards the violence in their country. Um, and this happened in the 1980s. Another major, major aspect of Swedish's, Sweden's government is that if you submit an allegation of violence, you are not allowed to withdraw it. So, um, whereas here, if you submit uh, an allegation of uh, domestic violence, you can withdraw it and it essentially gets dropped. In Yemen, if you submit an allegation of domestic violence or virtually any kind of violence, um, the matter has to be attended to and you have no choice but to um, pursue the male that um, inflicted violence upon you. Also in Sweden, um, the government funds 130 safe houses across the country that are open 24 hours to women who, um, who have uh, been beaten or received any other kind of violence. Um, so these are open to any woman at any time for any reason. But also, Sweden is still not perfect, which I do want to uh, reiterate through this entire presentation, even though the statistics lean significantly in the favor of Sweden, Gender parity cannot be reached until it is a complete 50-50 split in every category. Um, in Sweden, in 2010, there were 27,000 cases of domestic violence reported towards women. So um, significantly less than, well, there, are, there is no data for, that I could find for domestic violence in Sweden. It's estimated data, but because most of these allegations are not taken seriously in Yemen, um, it's not really kept uh, as a record. In 2007, Sweden adopted a bill that contained 56 measures to combat violence against women through the year 2012. Um, this also allocated um, nearly $20 million in US dollars to help push these funds through the government and get, them, uh, get these programs available to women. They also created six steps to promote the intolerance of violence towards women. And those are um, greater protection and support to those exposed to violence. And that goes back to the safe houses. Uh, they place a great deal of um, importance on a safe place for a woman to go if she has been exposed to any violence. And a greater emphasis on preventative work um, so an emphasis on where to start preventative work, um, like what age in school, which in Sweden it does start at a very young age. Um, higher standards and greater efficiency in the judicial system. So they look further into um, these issues within the judicial system. And stronger measures tar targeting violent offenders. Um, so these uh, violent offenders are not dismissed in court. They actually do receive punishment. Um, increased cooperation um, between men and women uh, regarding the issue. And improved knowledge, so education um, um, and through the entire country on what the issues are that women are facing. Um, violence against women in the USA, 4.8 million women are assaulted per year in the United States. Um, in 1994, the Violence Against Women Act was passed, um, $1.6 billion to combat violence. But another issue that women faced with that, well, that the country faced with that is that once it was passed, it took more than a, another year to get the money from the Newt Gingrich-led um, House or Congress. In uh, 2005, they reauthorized this bill through 2010 and increased it to $4 billion over that course of five years. Um, 
what I wanted to sum all of this up to is that women give birth to men and this creates another violent cycle that um, need, that needs to end. Um, women get pregnant, carry a child for nine months, there's a 50% chance that the child is going to be male and if you, so therefore if you live in Yemen there's a 50% chance that the child you're going to give birth to is going to have rights and essentially ownership over you once they're born. A major issue. Um, and also, um, gender parity cannot be reached unless both sides work towards it. Um, which, um, part of the reason that I took such an interest in this issue is that I think that by having a male promote these issues, it shows that they are not only female issues, they are issues that pertain to um, both genders and the global world. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Professor Whitney. Um, Um, in Yemen, um, I should say that my data was very, very limited because it's just not public, so I don't have an answer for that. Um, as for Sweden, it is predominantly white, but Sweden also has a significantly larger white population than we do and a significantly lower um, African-American minority population than what we do. Any other questions? Um, and we've addressed this in class, and you talked about the, uh, the, the concept of quotas that are implemented in various countries as an attempt to uh, give parity to men and women, in, um, or to women particularly, in, in government. Um, what are your thoughts on quotas for women? You, you address the fact that um, it's often received the same way that affirmative action is. It's assumed that those women or people of color, uh, white women or people of color, are uh, chosen because of their gender or their race rather than their capabilities. It's always assumed to, often assumed that. So what are your thoughts? Um, I, I have a problem with a quota system that only puts women in their position because of their gender. Um, if there is a way to create a quota system that not only measures gender but also the aptitude of the woman, I would be more in favor of that. Simply because, just because you put a woman in office doesn't mean that she's going to use her new position to address women's issues. Um, I think that if she doesn't address women's issues, it kind of contributes to the problem. Um, but why do you think, though, that, I mean, we sort of have a de facto quota system for men here, I mean, the majority is male, um, and we don't have an aptitude test, I think, for our politicians. So uh, why is it assumed that women are going to be chosen because of their gender and not their ability? Well, um, to go back to the beginning of that statement, I would firmly support an aptitude test because men are also stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I said it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, in that aspect, I would much rather an aptitude test that covers issues and competence that men and women would take. That way you have, you know, you could end up with a completely female um, body, but they are also competent, if that addresses the question. Dr. Hillwood? Uh, Travis, uh, your <coughs> discussion about Sweden reminded me of this uh, fact that in Sweden, in health classes, they teach high school students about male and female orgasms. And so you might want to put it, because here, what do we teach? Abstinence only. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a different approach. <laughs> so you can add that to you. But I have a question, though, about um, for the United States. Uh, this stuff, you know, people would be surprised. Right, they think that, well, a lot of my students believe that there is absolute equality between men and women in this country. And a lot of my students would not self-identify as feminists. I mean, I've asked them. And so what's, how do we get the word out? How do you 
make some of this data available to you know the population at large. I mean, it, it seems to be in the case of the United States, or at least we hold equality as an ideal. There's a heck of a lot of misinformation or ignorance. So. Um, I think in the United States, um, one of the biggest barriers that we put, that we ourselves put in front of ourselves is that we focus on the history of the women's rights movement. And so in history, we'll trace it from the beginning to where it's currently at, and we focus on the progress that it's made instead of focusing on the more progress that it could be making. Um, so I think if we were to put, if we were to place greater emphasis on how much better we could be than where we are, we would begin to do better instead of just um, patting ourselves on the back for what we've already done. There's, Jeff, just to add that in history, they call it uh, this, the history of the women's movement in the past as the women worthies. Like you hold up, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and you know, all the Susan B. Anthony, but it's not really a serious attempt to look at which is what social scientists do, the structural inequalities and things inherent within the society. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys very much for coming. Thank you.